In our headlines on this Tuesday afternoon, April 11th. Seoul and Washington reaffirmed the dedication to their alliance in the face of additional disclosure of alleged classified U.S. military documents that include a timeline of ammunition delivery from South Korea to an unspecified destination. Meanwhile, the Bank of Korea announces intentions to keep its benchmark interest rate steady at 3.5% in light of slowing inflation against the backdrop of a host of internal and external economic uncertainties. And neighboring Japan's most recently published annual diplomatic report fails to include the country's acknowledgement of past atrocities against Korea, but includes its false territorial claim over South Korea's Tokdo Island. Concerns continue to mount as more classified U.S. military documents are shared online, including a timeline about the delivery of ammunition by South Korea to an unspecified destination. Amid the latest developments, Washington has rejected the possibility of the rampant unauthorized disclosures, disrupting its alliance with Seoul. Our Song Yoo Jin has the latest. The United States says it is engaging with allies and partners regarding the recent leak of its highly classified military documents. The leak has been causing alarm around the world as some documents show the U.S. could have been eavesdropping on key allies like Israel and South Korea. U.S. officials uh, uh, across the interagency are engaging with allies and partners at high levels over this, including to reassure them of our commitment to safeguarding intelligence and uh, the fidelity of securing our partnerships as well. When asked about how the leak could impact South Korea-U.S. relations, the spokesperson said Washington's commitment towards Seoul remains ironclad. He went on to emphasize that South Korea is one of Washington's most important partners in the Indo-Pacific region. Defense ministers of the two countries held a phone call on Tuesday morning at the request of the U.S., during which it promised close communication and cooperation with Seoul regarding the matter. But concerns are growing in South Korea as another document related to the country has been found online. On Monday, local media outlets reported on a printed document titled ROK-155 Delivery Timeline. The one-page document, dated February 27, includes a 72-day timeline of when and how South Korea will deliver 330,000 artillery shells. Though it does not mention the final destination of the 155-millimeter shells, a previously leaked conversation between President Yoon Seok-yeol's then Secretary for Foreign Affairs and his national security adviser suggests it could be Ukraine. Citing the leaked documents, the New York Times detailed the two advisers' conversation where the Foreign Affairs Secretary expresses concern that the U.S. would not be the end user if South Korea complies with its request for ammunition. In February, the U.S. had reportedly inquired about purchasing ammunition from South Korea, but Seoul was worried about supplies reaching Ukraine and going against its long-standing policy of not supplying weapons to countries at war. The National Security Advisor then suggested selling 330,000 rounds of 155-millimeter artillery shells to Ukraine's neighbor Poland as a roundabout solution to the issue. Song Yoo-jin, Arirang News. Right, and those allegations of eavesdropping have raised concerns about secure communication within the top office building in Yongsan. Well, the presidential office has brushed aside these concerns and cast out instead on the authenticity of some of the alleged secret U.S. documents disclosed online. Our senior top office correspondent Oh Soo Young reports. South Korea's presidential office has dismissed concerns that the United States has been wiretapping the country's national security office. This follows media reports over alleged Pentagon documents leaked online. In a phone call with Yonhap News on Tuesday, a presidential official said eavesdropping and wiretapping of internal conversations at the top office building in Yongtan is impossible, saying that a highly stringent anti-wiretapping system was put in place when relocating from the Blue House last year. The official also brushed off concerns that the contents of National Security Office meetings held in the underground of the Yongtan building were compromised, drawing a line on whether a conversation between two senior personnel took place within the premises. This comes after classified documents seemingly leaked from the Pentagon were reported in U.S. media. The documents appear to contain conversations between South Korean national security officials. The intelligence leak has stirred controversy over whether the U.S. is wiretapping its allies, 
and comes over just two weeks before Yoon's summit with Joe Biden in Washington, D.C. Seoul's presidential office has maintained that the reports are unconfirmed and are likely to have been fabricated. It says discussions with the U.S. and verification of the details should be prioritized. You know, obviously, there's a red line. Every state has them. It accepts you know, spying and espionage, even from friends and allies, up to a certain point. But at some point, there's a sort of you know, unspoken uh, code of conduct or an unspoken set of rules that states are supposed to follow. And I think South Korea you know, will want to reiterate that to the United States. First Deputy Director of the National Security Office, Kim tae told reporters on Tuesday that Seoul and Washington agreed there has been tampering of details in the documents and the leak cannot be a variable in Seoul and Washington's relations. He said that since the two allies are closely engaged in information sharing, the crisis can be turned into an opportunity to solidify trust and strengthen the cooperation system between the two countries. Woo Seung, Arirang News. Also on the diplomatic front, Japan's latest annual report on diplomacy makes no mention of the country's apologies for past atrocities here in Korea, as did its previous editions. Our foreign affairs correspondent Pei Yunji explains. Last month, the South Korean government announced its plan to compensate Korean victims of Japan's wartime forced labor through a public foundation, instead of through the Japanese firms found guilty by a South Korean court. At the time, Japan's foreign minister said he hoped the solution would help restore ties between the countries and said the Japanese government will continue to uphold the apologies it made in the past. On this occasion, we confirm that the Japanese government continues to uphold the stance on historical recognition made by previous cabinets as a whole, including the joint declaration between Japan and South Korea made in October 1998. But this was not included in Japan's newly published Diplomatic Blue Book, an annual report on Japan's foreign policy and activities, released on Tuesday. Regarding the issue of compensating wartime forced labor victims, the report explained that Seoul and Tokyo have been discussing it since President Yoon song yeol took office in May, through diplomatic channels and at the recent summit between the two countries' leaders. But the report did not explain the fact that Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi has said the Japanese government will uphold the stance made by previous cabinets, including the joint declaration between South Korea and Japan in 1998. The joint statement in 1998 between former South Korean President Kim Dae-jung and former Japanese Prime Minister Keizo Obuchi includes Tokyo's, quote, deep remorse and heartfelt apology for causing tremendous damage and suffering to Koreans during its colonial rule. The latest report also said South Korea has continued an illegal occupation of Tokto Island, which they refer to as Takeshima, with no legal basis. Japan has been saying this in its annual diplomatic blue book for six years, since 2018. In response, South Korea's foreign ministry spokesperson said in a statement on Tuesday that Japan should immediately retract the unjust sovereignty claim to what is an integral part of South Korean territory historically, geographically and under international law. The ministry also called in Naoki Kumagai, the deputy chief of mission at the Japanese embassy in Seoul, to protest. Pelunzi, Arirang News. South Korea has shared deep regret as North Korea remains unresponsive for the fifth day to routine cross-border communication via the liaison channel and the military hotline. In a televised statement on Tuesday, Seoul's unification minister Kwon Young-se found fault with Pyongyang for its unilateral and irresponsible action, adding that it would only serve to further isolate the regime. Kwon also condemned North Korea's use of South Korean facilities at the now-closed Kaesong Industrial Complex, underscoring the infringement of property rights as agreed under the broader joint accord over the complex. And North Korea's Kim Jong-un has reportedly ordered his military to ramp up war deterrence capabilities, according to the regime's state-run media on this Tuesday. Kim presided over a military, key military meeting that would be the day prior, during which he urged the need for practical and aggressive expansion of war deterrence. The report added that the meeting was convened in response to, quote, the aggressive acts and policies of South Korea and the U.S. Similar meetings were held in February as well as in March, and pundits are taking note of these developments as such meetings are reportedly held every six months or so.
Seoul Central Bank is holding its benchmark interest rate steady at 3.5 percent amid slowing inflation and a host of uncertainties. Our finance correspondent Ireyan reports. The Bank of Korea has decided to freeze the key interest rate for now. The central bank announced the decision during Tuesday's Monetary Policy Committee meeting, keeping the base interest rate at 3.5 percent. Considering inflation forecasts above the target level and financial risks expanding in major countries, we've decided to freeze the base rate and closely monitor the inflation slowdown and other economic uncertainties. This is the second time in a row that the central bank has decided to keep the rate unchanged with a 3.5 percent base rate in place for almost three months. Analysts say stabilizing consumer prices in South Korea was the main contributing factor behind the decision to freeze rates. The consumer price index, a key gauge of inflation, rose 4.2 percent on year in March, marking the slowest annual rise since March 2022. Worsening economic indicators, too, are mentioned as among the reasons for the central bank's decision. The country's GDP growth rate shrunk by 0.4 percent in the fourth quarter of last year, mainly due to sluggish exports. The balance of trade also recorded a deficit during the first two months of 2023 and the red for two consecutive months for the first time in 11 years. The global economic crisis caused by the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the liquidity crisis of Credit Suisse were also considered factors that stopped the BOK from imposing a rate hike. With the central bank's decision to hold the rate, the interest rate difference between South Korea and the U.S. stays at 1.5 percentage points. The last time the gap was so wide was 22 years ago and has sparked concerns that it could result in foreign capital outflow and a rise in the $1 exchange rate, leaving the possibility for more rate hikes in the near future. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. While the World Bank has raised its growth forecast for this year to 2 percent from its earlier projection of 1.7 percent, it has nonetheless joined the International Monetary Fund in raising concerns about geopolitical tensions and their broader impact on the global economy. Our Lee Sing jae has more. With the World Bank's and International Monetary Fund's spring meetings kicking off on Monday, World Bank Group President David Malpass says the global lender has revised its 2023 global growth outlook slightly upwards. Speaking at a media briefing on the same day, Malpass says the World Bank revised its 2023 growth forecast from the previous 1.7 percent to 2 percent, mainly due to an improved outlook for China's recovery from COVID-19 lockdowns. The World Bank chief also noted that advanced economies like the U.S. and those in Europe are faring a bit better than the World Bank anticipated in their January Global Economic Prospects report. However, Malpass also warned that volatility in the banking sector and higher oil prices could yet again put downward pressure on growth prospects in the second half of 2023. He also noted that a slowdown from stronger 2022 global economic growth will increase debt distress for developing countries. During the session with Malpass and IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gargeva, the two chiefs pointed out that geopolitical conflicts, like the situation in Ukraine, are putting a heavy burden on the economy and trade. Gergeva went as far as to say that the division caused by geopolitical conflicts is one of the biggest challenges the world economy needs to solve. Malpass, on the other hand, raised concerns over developing countries which have experienced capital outflows due to interest rate hikes. He also added that developing countries are suffering greatly from debt burdens, climate change, rising food prices and slowing growth. Global economic issues will continue to be discussed during the 2023 spring meetings of the World Bank Group and the International Monetary Fund, which takes place from April 10th to the 16th in Washington, D.C. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. Back here in Korea, a hefty portion of the country's annual budget for research and development will be spent on 11 key industries and the government is hoping to work with industry heavyweights to ensure a productive outcome. Our Moon Hedian explains. South Korea's Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy held a roundtable on Monday with chief technology officers from nine South Korean firms, including Samsung Display, Hyundai Motor and POSCO, to discuss investment plans for the year ahead. The government announced that it will be spending 70 percent of its annual budget for research and development across 40 different projects in 11 key investment areas, those being semiconductors, displays, secondary batteries, future mobility, core materials, 
advanced manufacturing, robots, aerospace and defense, advanced bio, next generation nuclear power and new energy industries. The ministry explained that the public and private sectors will be working together to establish clear goals and investment directions for each sector and focus their investment on selected strategic projects. In the past, the government faced criticism for its unclear approach to investments in research and development, but through collaboration with the private sector, it hopes that it will be able to invest wisely. Furthermore, a project manager group will be formed to manage the process of technological development, commercialization and talent development. With the slump in the semiconductor industry amid falling semiconductor prices and the economic slowdown affecting exports, the government plans to invest in four semiconductor projects to revitalize the industry. These include developing semiconductors for mobility, energy and home appliances as well as pursuing semiconductor technology development projects for autonomous vehicles. As of Monday, the government has identified 34 projects to invest in. This will later be expanded to 40 projects after further consultation with experts. Moon Haeryeon, Arirang News. Firefighters are racing against time to put out a wild blaze in the mountains of Gangneung City on the country's east coast that began Tuesday morning. The Korea Forest Service has since raised its wildfire response alert to its highest level of three. More than 300 people have been evacuated and at least 40 houses and other infrastructure have been burnt. Now, President Yoon seok has called for an all-out effort to extinguish the fire as soon as possible. And today, that is April 11th, Korea marks its 104th anniversary of the founding of the Korean Provisional Government. A commemorative event was held at Sodemun Independence Park here in Seoul. Some 400 people took part, including the families of independence fighters. The Korean Provisional Government was formed in April 1919, shortly after the March 1st movement and its related protests. The provisional body played a key role in Korea's independence movement against Japanese colonial rule until the country's liberation 27 years later. More relevant information can be found in the metaverse via a platform recently unveiled by the Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs. The platform is called EOON and can be accessed from the National Memorial of the Korean Provisional Government website. Fountains along Seoul's Hangang River will light up the capital city with colours and music after sunset. According to the Seoul Metropolitan Government, the Panpo Bridge Rainbow Fountain and the Yoido Park Floating Fountain have been in operation since April 1st. But eight more fountains spanning the river, including one at Nanjin Hangang Park, are also set to join the nocturnal lighting event starting in May. And two more, including the Tuksam Park water screen, will open in July. For more information on the locations and operating hours of the fountains, visit the Seoul Hangang Park headquarters website. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In the United States, at least four people have been killed and nine wounded in a mass shooting at a bank. The shooting happened in the state of Kentucky in Louisville on Monday local time. Three of the wounded are in critical condition. The gunman was using a rifle and was shot and killed by responding police officers. He was identified as a 23-year-old bank employee who had recently found out he would be fired. He is said to have left a note to family and friends, suggesting his intention to carry out the shooting and live-streamed the attack. Kentucky passed a law in March prohibiting its state and local authorities from enforcing any federal restrictions related to firearms. Turning over to the war in Ukraine, Kyiv and Moscow have exchanged over 200 troops in the latest prisoner swap. According to both countries, the swap took place on Monday local time, but it's not known how it was carried out. It saw 100 Ukrainian and 106 Russian soldiers returned home. Officials from both sides say that their soldiers are in bad shape and are being treated for injuries and receiving rehabilitation. Ukrainian officials allege that some of their troops were also tortured, 
while Russian officials say their servicemen were in mortal danger in Ukrainian captivity. Meanwhile, in France, five bodies have been pulled from the rubble of a collapsed building in the city of Marseille amid ongoing search and rescue efforts. Three people are still missing. The building came down after an explosion on Sunday morning local time, which authorities say was likely caused by a gas leak. The explosion also damaged nearby buildings, causing two to partially collapse a few hours later. Initial rescue efforts were hampered by dust and heat from the fire, which took a crew of 100 firefighters hours to extinguish. The disaster marks the second time in five years that a building has collapsed in the port city. In November 2018, eight people were killed when two houses collapsed due to structural issues. And finally, Sky News Australia is quitting TikTok. The news outlet reported on Monday that it would stop publishing videos on its account, leaving behind its 65,000 followers. It cited security concerns as the main reason, alleging that the platform takes data from its users. It comes after TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, fired four employees in December 2022 for accessing the personal data of two journalists working for the Financial Times and BuzzFeed. TikTok has already been banned from official devices used by employees of several governments and organizations over allegations the app is controlled by Beijing. But TikTok maintains that the Chinese government has no control over the app. Matthew Ashley, Adidang News. Good afternoon. It's amazing to see how weather patterns can switch so quickly in just a day, from fine spring weather to a typhoon force windy day. A wind advisory has been issued in the east and west coast regions as well as the capital area. In fact, the mountainous regions in Kamondo province are seeing a violent gale force winds of 110 kilometers an hour. While it could be difficult to stand without holding on to something and even cars will not be able to drive at normal speed. And along with violent winds, rain is soaking the nation. Try not to get wet by today's rainfall. It is very likely that rain will be mixed with yellow dust today. A strong umbrella is a must or have your raincoat ready to avoid that dusty rain. Daily highs are slightly lower in central regions, but going up as high as Monday in southern parts of the country. After the rain, colder air moves into the country, dragging down the morning temperatures to just 5 degrees Celsius here in the capital tomorrow, about 10 degrees lower than this morning. Then another band of rain is in the forecast between Friday and Saturday. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. Right, and on that note, we say goodbye. We have our daily panel session coming up right after this break, so do stay with us.